Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Lucas Minton. I will be uh, facilitating the session today. Um, unfortunately, my colleague, Jean Redpath, who was listed on the invitation to uh, facilitate today, is not available. Um, so we'll uh, proceed in her absence. I head up Africa Criminal Justice Reform at the Dalla Omar Institute um, at the University of the Western Cape. Uh, today's uh, webinar is on the prosecution of corruption in municipalities and uh, our main draw card uh, is uh, Advocate Barry Madolo, the Director of Public Prosecutions in the Eastern Cape. Um, but before we uh, uh, get into uh, the nitty gritty of today's discussion, I want to use the opportunity and just make a few remarks about uh, corruption and the investigation thereof, just to set the scene before I introduce our panelists. Um, I think we can agree that the basic definition of corruption is the, the use of public office for private gain. Uh, that seems to be the most, the, the shortest and uh, most functional definition. But we can also look at corruption as almost like a, a mathematical formula, where we say, on the one hand, if uh, a public official has discretion, uh, they have monopoly over that discretionary powers they have, but uh, minus accountability, then the result will be corruption. So uh, monopoly plus discretion minus accountability, and then the result is corruption. We also know from research that has been done in many parts of the world that the minimum requirements for an anti-corruption strategy is firstly that there must be prevention. Uh, and this typically relates to educating public officials about what corruption is, how corruption happens. It's about sharing information, training staff, and so forth. The second component is uh, systems development or capacity building, as it is sometimes called. And I think Yap will probably speak a bit more to that. Um, about the ability that organizations such as government departments have to deal with corruption, um, to manage it, to reduce the risks for corruption and so forth. And then the third component, minimum requirement for an anti-corruption strategy is then enforcement or investigation and prosecutions. And, and that is where uh, Advocate Madolo uh, will come in today. So the the opportunity for this webinar today presented itself when Advocate Madolo uh, published an op-ed in the Daily Maverick on the 24th of April, reporting on recent successes in the Eastern Cape in, Eastern Cape in prosecuting corruption cases in local government. Um, and from our sort side, we thought, well, this is a very good opportunity to reflect on some good news. I think as South African society, uh, we do want to hear good news about what is happening, uh, what steps government and state institutions are taking to address crime and corruption. Uh, and so the article from uh, Africa Mandolo about successes in the Eastern Cape were indeed good news. Um, but we must also look at uh, what was reported there in relation to what the Zonda Commission has found recently, where it raised concerns about the devolution of procurement to all levels of uh, government, but we've not seen a concomitant devolution of investigative and prosecutorial powers to the lowest levels of, of, of government. Uh, and that is important if we are to, to see an effective response from local government uh, in regards to corruption. From our side, we are also very interested in what is happening in the district and regional courts, uh, as important as the high level 
prosecutions are um, and, and recent events concerning the Guptas are testimony to that. We must also remember that uh, in the longer term, it is what is happening in the lower courts that will be of tremendous importance. So um, without further ado, let's, uh, let me introduce the uh, panelists, if uh, the screen can uh, also play along. Um, uh, I'm not going to introduce myself. Uh, Jaap de Visser is the director at the Dalla Omar Institute, uh, as I've already said. Um, he is a B2 rated researcher with the NRF, um, and he's also co-author of Local Government Law of South Africa, and uh, as, uh, is, is a considered expert in multi-level governance, local government, good governance, and federalism in Africa, and he has widely published on this. Um, then advocate Madolo is the DPP for the Eastern Cape. Um, he started at the shop floor in the prosecution service, uh, as one could put it. Uh, he proceeded to attain uh, an LLB later on. He was also part of the Directorate for Special Operations from 2001 um, and became a Director of Public Prosecutions in 2011. Um, and uh, he also serves on the National Council for Correctional Services. So um, our program is not complicated. Um, we are going to give each speaker 20 to 25 minutes, and then we'll open the floor for uh, comments and questions. Um, and uh, if not many, two rules there. Uh, we follow the Chatham House rule in principle. If, if there are any members of the media or any, anybody else who wishes to quote any of the speakers, or, uh, then you need permission from them, please. And then uh, we encourage our participants to uh, make use of the chat box function in Zoom. We are not going to take verbal inputs, so please uh, put your comments and questions in the in the chat box and uh, we will deal with that uh, as we proceed. Um, so, and lastly, before we proceed, I would like to thank the Hans Seidel Foundation as well as the Open Society uh, Foundation for South Africa uh, for uh, supporting our work and especially for the Hans Seidel Foundation for making today's webinar possible. You will get a survey uh, to uh, provide us with your feedback on the webinar. So we encourage you please to fill that out. Uh, also note that the uh, webinar is recorded um, and we will make that recording available. Uh, it will be available for a limited time period. So without any further ado, I would like to hand over to Jaap now uh, to take us through his presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Lucas. Thanks for that introduction. Um, let me switch on my screen. Uh, hopefully that's visible. If not, I'm sure somebody will alert me to that. But uh, good morning, everyone. And thanks again, Lucas, for that introduction. Um, it's, it's beautiful to see we are almost at 150 participants and they're still trickling in. So that's, that's a wonderful turnout and clearly an indication of the importance of, of this topic. And, uh, and as you said, the main draw card being that we are so fortunate to have uh, a representative of the NPA, very senior representative of the NPA talking to us this morning on this platform. So um, much appreciation to Advocate Madolo for joining us this morning and sharing his insights. Um, uh, Lucas, when you introduce me as a, a B2 rated scholar, I always feel the need to, to ex explain that because B rated almost sounds a bit like uh, you know, like a B rated movie, you know, you're not very good, you know, like a, a second a second grade researcher. Um, so uh, one of the things that I do want to uh, add to that, you know, it's just an indication of, 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 of academic reputation, but uh, I'm not a criminal justice expert by any stretch of the imagination. I know a few things about local government, 
Um, and that was sort of uh, uh, drew me into this discussion. Um, and um, uh, I think there are many people in this room, including the chair, um, and of course, our, our, our main guests that know much more about criminal justice than I do. So my angle is really going to be uh, looking at it from the perspective of, of local government. Um, and the previous webinar that we did a few weeks ago, we focused also on corruption in local government, but focused on the disciplinary approach, you know, the implementation of codes of conduct for staff and counselors and disciplinary procedures, et cetera. Um, and we already noted that the next webinar is going to deal with corruption in local government as a criminal offense. Of course, looking at police investigation, prosecution and trial, the obvious uh, three phases of, of the um, pursuing of, of corruption in local government as a criminal offense. And I want to start off with a bit of a, a bit of a sad statistic, but also a dated statistic. But maybe it's it's a good starting point just to indicate how where we come from, uh, and 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 how much improvement uh, hopefully has been made and is being made. In June 2020, Minister Lamola, in response to a parliamentary question, um, indicated that between 2006 and 2020, there had been 67 prosecutions of of corruption in local government. Um, only four of those uh, resulted in a conviction and they took place uh, or they, they, they pertained to four municipalities. So that was a very poor statistics, a very poor statistic of, of uh, um, the extent to which corruption in local government has been successfully prosecuted. And compare that to you know, the dismal performance that you know, the Auditor General year after year reports on, um, that was very, very unconvincing. Uh, so the two questions that I want to sort of reflect on uh, is why does it seem to be so hard to prosecute corruption in local government successfully? And, and improvement since then, and, and I think that's where Advocate Madola will come in with, with the good news story of, of, the, of the, um, the efforts that are being made in, in, in prosecuting corruption in local government, particularly in, in the Eastern Cape. So I'm gonna focus a bit on the first question, why, why is it so hard? And I'll do that based on uh, research that we've done in 2020, um, together with my colleagues, uh, Jenica Birkes, Tabile Tonto, and, and uh, Professor Dinash Chiguata, where we looked at combating corruption in local government, focusing on uh, municipalities in the Western Cape. It was a project we did in collaboration with the Department of Local Government here in the Western Cape and was also supported by the Hans Seidel Foundation. Um, the reports are available on, on our website and, and uh, will also be shared in the chat box. So much of what I have to say is based on the research that we did. And what we did there was we did, um, of course, we, we reviewed the law and there's a, an overview of the legal framework for combating corruption in local government. But we also went out into the field and conducted interviews with politicians and officials from 10 municipalities and the provincial government in the Western Cape. And we focused the interviews on their experience in referring alleged financial misconduct for criminal investigation and prosecution. What happened? What was their experience? How did it work? And, and what were the concerns expressed by, by those interviewees? So the research is a little bit dated. It was done two years ago. And of course, a lot has happened since. And, and Advocate Madolo, I think, will, will be best placed to, to, to tell us more about that. But I think still the observations made by those that we interviewed are still very much relevant. Um, and there were quite a few observations from the people that we spoke to um, about uh, the concerns with um, what happens when matters are referred to uh, SAPS, the Hawks, and, and the NPA for investigation, prosecution, and trial. Um, you know, the very obvious concern that, that many interviewees raised was around the duration of investigation, prosecution, and trial. In one interviewee said, you know, there's a pending investigation that I know of in presenting to my municipality. It's been coming on since 2011. Only one senior investigator has been assigned to the case. Um, that same individual is also responsible for investigations in two other municipalities and it's just taking forever and it may just be fizzling out. So many of the interviewees expressed frustration with how long it took for SAPS uh, and or the Hawks to investigate and for the NPA to, to prosecute. 
There were also concerns expressed about the capacity and also sometimes the prioritization within SAPs and the Hawks. Um, and surprisingly to us, also some confusion about the intersection with municipal disciplinary processes, where some of the interviews told us, well, SAPs didn't want to investigate until we were finalized, un until we had our internal disciplinary proceedings uh, with respect to the affected staff members or councillors uh, uh, completed, which was, a, um, I think, a misunderstanding or a, a wrong interpretation of, of the law uh, that for some reason SAPs refused to investigate um, before the disciplinary had been completed. And even some interviews, you know, voicing their concerns about alleged political interference. You know, one uh, a municipal manager told us, you know, there were allegations about his traffic officer who accepted bribes. Uh, there were affidavits. The case was reported to SAPs, but there was such a reluctance to investigate the matter because the SAPs official was a family member of one of the councillors, so nothing came from the case. Of course, these are all, you know, views and subjective views, but I think it speaks to sort of a, a, a perception at least of uh, the possibility of, uh, of political interference with the investigative priorities of, of SAPs and the Hawks. And then turning to the NPA, because I think that's the main focus of, of this morning's discussion, um, a lot of the interviews also expressed concern about resources and prioritization. Um, of course, you know, the main point being that the NPA is hopelessly overstretched doesn't have uh, the budget and the resources to really pay close attention to, to corruption in local government. And I think this one quote, I think illustrates it quite, quite nicely. And you'll find more quotes similar to this in the report. But, but one uh, municipal manager told us, you know, one of my employees, he had committed a corrupt act. We hired ourselves as a municipality of forensic auditor. We used the report to discipline him and he was dismissed. So, you know, that was the work that the municipality itself did. But I then also laid a charge and I didn't hear anything for a few years until the senior prosecutor phoned me and asked me, can I make the forensic auditors available? And I wanted to give him their number, but he wanted me to pay for the forensic auditor. And I told him that this is no longer justifiable for me because I lost money due to the corruption because of course the corrupt act resulted in, in, in funds being lost to the municipality. I had to hire a forensic investigator, that cost a lot of money. I had to run a disciplinary process to fire the guy, that cost me money. And now I have to pay again to assist the NPA with the investigation. At some point, it just no longer makes any financial sense. It's not justifiable. I can't do that to the taxpayers here in the municipality. So I had to let go of that. So I think it's a clear ind indication of, of the, the lack of resources and sometimes the um, how that, how that plays out in, in practice. Another point that I want to raise is linked to the capacity constraints within the NPA, but more around the, um, the difficulty of proving the unlawfulness of corrupt actions in local governments. Um, because, and, and one of the interviews said, so you, you need specialized expertise. And this one interview said the criminal justice response to fraud and corruption in the municipalities is lacking because prosecutors are not trained in the MFMA. So if your prosecutor doesn't understand the MFMA, the Municipal Finance Management Act and the local government legislation, they will forever try to use ordinary commercial law. And that's when uh, sometimes their efforts are not successful. Another interview said this, he said, you know, when I got involved in having to assist the NPA with, with prosecutions, I first had to explain to them how these projects get approved in the municipality, the one, the project with which there was, there was, there was alleged corruption. And the prosecutor asked me, when did it start being unlawful? They must know the policies when it comes to these types of projects. The prosecutor has to be made aware of that policy. They wouldn't know the policies of the municipality. So then I have to relate that to supply chain. Where does it say in supply chain policy that you can do this? And that's different for each municipality. It's not necessarily the same across the municipalities. All of the intricacies of the interactions between legislation, policy, bylaws, practice, delegations, all of those you must know as a prosecutor. So the point here is that it's hard. It's not easy to prosecute corruption in local government because um, the corruption will always be uh, uh, committed 
in the context of the interaction between national legislation, perhaps the most notably the Municipal Finance Management Act, the regulations under the Municipal Finance Management Act, the policies adopted by the municipality on that specific type of activity or project, um, the supply chain management policy of the municipality, uh, particularly if it pertains procurement uh, issues, the delegations within a municipality, who is responsible for what, which official or which councillor was involved in preparing the decision, writing a report, advising, who made the decision, uh, who was responsible for the appeal, if there was any. So there's a whole intricacy of, of delegations within a municipality that also comes into play. So the point is, it's a complex picture. And the picture is different for each and every municipality because it's not just one law that you have to apply and implement. Um, there are different policies in different municipalities. And the point here would be that it's all good and well for a forensic auditor or for an investigator to point out certain wrongdoing and to connect the dots and to point out uh, dubious transactions and to uh, to create the narrative of, of what went wrong, but to actually prove the unlawfulness, uh, to actually make a legal case uh, that can stand up in court um, uh, as against local government legislation uh, and municipal policies and delegations, etc. For that, you need specialized expertise, which I think for a long time, and hopefully it is improving, for a long time was sorely lacking in the NPA. There was simply not enough prosecutors, senior prosecutors um, that had that kind of expertise because the focus was very much on the national picture um, and not sufficiently on the legislative framework as it pertains to local government. Um, so now we, we're not just complaining and we're not just sort of raising concerns. We're also thinking about, so what, you know, what, what is the way out? What, what, can, what can be improved? And one of the questions that came up in the research is, is there a, an argument for the expansion of investigative activity by municipalities themselves? Should there, for example, be more scope for municipalities to investigate corruption themselves? Could the municipality prepare the docket for the NPA, so to speak? And, and, and avoid a duplication of effort when a municipality investigates um, alleged corruption in the context of a disciplinary case pertaining to a staff member or a councillor, which must then, must then be done all over again when the matter is referred to, uh, to, to SAPS, the Hawks and the NPA for, for, for investigation and corruption. Could there be closer collaboration between municipalities and the criminal justice system to avoid the duplication of effort. Uh, we all know that you know, cities, metros already do it to, to the great extent. They have um, investigative capacity. Um, the Itaquini municipality has, uh, has a city integrity investigations unit uh, with about 70 people there. Um, Joburg also has a group forensic investigation servers. The city of Cape Town has an a special investigating unit so metropolitan municipalities already develop their investigative capacity, but usually aimed at preparing disciplinary charges. But what is the scope for using some of that capacity more smartly also in the context of, of investigations in the criminal justice uh, um, uh, terrain? I think that is an interesting question that, that can perhaps uh, uh, take the issue forward as well. Another question that could be asked is, what about prosecuting smaller corruption in, in the lower courts, which are overburdened already, what about prosecuting that in municipal courts? Uh, some of our bigger municipalities have municipal courts. Uh, obviously their focus is on, on, on bylaws and on traffic offenses, but could that be expanded for the prosecution of smaller corruption? Uh, in our previous webinar, we reflected on the manifestations of corruption. And of course, there are the big corruption cases, particularly in the metros, but there's also small corruption, people stealing from the municipal store um, or people um, accepting bribes for, for traffic offenses. Um, does all of that need to follow the same route or is there scope for prosecuting some of these uh, um, offenses of smaller corruption in municipal courts? I think that's a very interesting 
question with, with lots of scope for, for progress. And I think in general, the question is what about greater collaboration between municipalities and I think mainly the cities and the National Prosecuting Authority? Um, because municipalities, um, uh, of course, are often in the dock. Their municipal officials uh, can, can end up in the dock, but there's also lots of capacity within particularly the bigger cities um, that could be that could be turned to to greater use in investigating and preparing prosecutions. On the downside of that is, of course, a number of arguments that would weigh against it. First of all, being the independence of the NPA. Constitutionally, the National Prosecuting Authority, uh, national government, has the constitutional prerogative to investigate or to to prosecute uh, uh, criminal offences. Uh, so the legal basis for municipal investigation would have to be looked at very carefully. What is the legal basis for the municipal investigation of, of corruption? And I thought this is a very important, important issue. We already have the municipal police services, uh, which operate in many of our cities, and they have uh, already uh, seen an incremental increase in their powers. Uh, they may seize objects, they may seize articles, they may enter premises, they may sometimes use force, take body prints, they can make arrests without a warrant if, it's, if, if it pertains to offences uh, for which the municipality uh, has jurisdiction, and they can seize any article used in the commission of, a, of an offence, and those offences include corruption. So there is scope uh, for investigative uh, uh, activity by municipalities, but it has to it has to be looked at carefully. There are also limits to the municipality's investigative reach, because, for example, the power to access bank accounts or the power to intercept electronic communication has not been extended to municipalities or municipal police services. So there are limits to what a municipality is by law. Uh, empowered to do, even in the context of, of preparing disciplinary charges. Um, and this also came out in the, in the research that we did. For example, one municipal manager said it was very frustrating when we tried to recover funds, was that in one of those cases, we had to eventually hand it over to the Hawks because we needed the Hawks uh, for, for, for accessing uh, documents and bank accounts, etc. And we couldn't do that. So we could only operate with the information that we had, what we could scrape together through our own processes. So there are hard limits to the investigative powers and reach of municipalities. And of course, the argument will also be, and certainly in smaller municipalities, that you know now you are asking or expecting the municipality itself to investigate, and that's where the trouble began to you know, what was, was, was prevalent to begin with. So municipalities are too close for comfort. One of the interviewees said, yes, it's a good idea potentially to, to expand the scope of municipalities to investigate. But what if those guys in the municipality are themselves crooks? Uh, I would be very careful. So there are, of course, um, there's, there's, there's arguments on the contrary that we have to be very careful with extending investigative um, expectations, I suppose, to, to municipalities. The last point uh, before I close off is uh, what about the provincial governments? Is there scope for greater collaboration between provinces and the NPA? Because, for example, our provinces exercise oversight over municipalities and at times even institute formal commissions of inquiry, um, which are like like the Zondo Commission, you know, clothed with powers to subpoena, etc., cetera. Um, they do so and they conduct comprehensive investigations into maladministration and corruption in municipalities. But what happens to that information? Our understanding on the basis of the interviews was that ultimately that information simply gets handed back to the municipality for further action. Unless, of course, the province decides to intervene in terms of Section 139 and take over the municipality, but that still doesn't result in criminal prosecution. So, for example, one of the provincial officials that we interviewed said, we have handed all our Section 106 investigations, these commissions of inquiry, we handed it over to the Hawks and the NPA, but we haven't yet seen any outcome. Nobody has even appeared in court, but theoretically it could speed up the process. 
So is there scope for greater collaboration between provincial governments and the National Prosecuting Authority along the lines of what Professor Munting indicated in his introduction, perhaps a greater decentralization uh, approach within the NPA, which is still very centralized? And is there scope for a more dynamic relationship between provincial governments and their role in overseeing municipalities and sometimes even inquiring uh, in, into municipalities with these commissions of inquiry uh, and assisting the NPA in one way or another in, um, in conducting uh, uh, um, uh, investigations and prosecutions of corruption in local government. So there are a number of ideas that have come uh, across our table in this research, some are ideas, and of course it's, it's complicated and none of these things are easy. Uh, and local government is a sphere of government that is currently, I think, in the dog box for, for, for I think, for, for very legitimate reasons. There are many, many municipalities in, in deep trouble as a result of, of corrupt activities. Uh, but of course, it's very heartening to see progress uh, in, uh, in the NPA's efforts to, to prosecute some of, particularly some of the big corruption cases. And uh, it would be, it'd be uh, great to hear more from Advocate Madolo on, uh, yeah, on what went on. And, and what his feedback is um, on, on the progress made thus far. But this is sort of what we came across in our research, uh, which I think makes for some, yeah, uh, uh, some food for thought in how we approach the issue of prosecuting corruption in, in local governments. Um, so that's all from my side, Lucas. So let me, let me hand back to you. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Jaap. Uh, I think there is indeed a lot of uh, food for thought there, and I see some questions are already coming through. Um, Advocate Barry, can we just uh, have you unmute, please, uh, so that we, there we are. So uh, um, I'm going to hand over to you. Crystal is going to handle your PowerPoint presentation. So uh, just remind her when you need a new slide. So uh, Advocate Madolo, please uh, proceed. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you, Prof. Good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you for this opportunity. I think my crime for being here was to publish that uh, report in the newspapers. Uh, that's why I'm here today. <laughs> Thanks to you, Prof. Um, I'm going to browse through the slides, uh, Crystal. If you may go to slide number three. Thank you. Um, I'm going to browse through. I'm not going to read this word for word. Uh, but what is important is in the Eastern Cape, we, we have developed a plan to deal with corruption because you will understand that the Eastern Cape is uh, very rural and, um, and most of our work when it comes to corruption is in the municipalities. Now, what we've done is we have sort of decentralized our work we have a commercial crimes court in Port Elizabeth, which is now Kabelka, another one in East London, and another one in Umtata, and that is a very new court. And the purpose is that we need to reach out, you know, in the whole province. So that is the footprint that we have. And each commercial crimes court is headed by a, a, a deputy, that is each unit is headed by a deputy. And um, so that has helped us sort of in, in uh, you know, making sure that our presence is felt throughout the, the province. We, besides the commercial crime courts that we have, we do have some cases that are done in the regional court, but those cases are also monitored by the unit, that is the Specialized Commercial Crimes Unit, uh, which is you now serves also as a, 
way of empowering prosecutors in the lower courts so that they can deal with some of the matters because the commercial crimes courts cannot deal with everything. Now, the, 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 the pattern, when you look at all the cases is that, it, you know, they involve public servants, you know, consortiums, and, they, and the idea to siphon money from the public purse. And it, it's a pattern throughout, throughout the province that is a pattern. Everyone wants a slice, you know, of, of, of the cake. And in the process, they have to use people within the municipality. Some people are outside the municipality. They are just consortiums and the modus operandi is to, you know, interfere with the procurement processes, with the tender processes. And, uh, and sometimes this, the tender will be awarded to A, but for some reason it will be, it will be given to B. You know, that has been the modus operandi. Can you move to slide number four, please, Chris? These are some of the cases, you know, that I mentioned earlier. I'm, I'm not going to go through that, but that case is coming up on the 15th of July. Um, it is, you know, that is the current status of the case. I'm not going to go into the details of it. Can we go to slide number five, please? This is another matter that we're busy with. And if you look at the amount involved, it's about 100 million. Um, we're busy with that one. We're busy with racketeering charges, restrained papers, and the matter is going to be transferred to the High Court for pre-trial procedures. Next slide, please. And this is another matter where this one we finalized a long time ago, and we managed to get a 12-year sentence on that one. Uh, it's just one of those matters where we feel that, you know, we've had some successes and we thought we should highlight that. Can you move to the next slide, please? I, I hope you've been following those things. We had our, you know, they always say all the best laid plans can always collapse right at the end. This matter was supposed to run you know, we've set aside whole time for the matter to run. But unfortunately, we, you know, we had some hurdles. Uh, the defense, you know, raised all sort of interlocutory obligations. And the, and the matter is now, you know, has been to the, to the appeal court, and it is now headed for the constitutional court just on interlocutory applications. We have not even gone into the trial yet. Uh, though our plan was to run with that case, case for the whole term. We're going back to court in August. We're hoping that by then, you know, the, the, the courts will have made a ruling on the recusal of the judge. Thank you. Can you move to this next slide, please? All right. Um, this is another matter. We were restrained in this matter. Uh, we are awaiting a conviction. The amount involved, uh, you'll see that is 5.9 million for transporting men, uh, mourners. Uh, AFU has done its job there. Um, we've already had a fine. I'm sorry, not a fine, but the attorney is paying back money uh, that he benefited from this. So it's the same matter that we do, you know, I referred to earlier. Can you move to the next one, please? Um, and this is one of the successes, you know, that we have had so far. I, I won't go into details, but that one is done and dusted and I choose is doing time for that. Can you move to the next one? Social development, amount involved 30 million. Case is at the High Court, it will be had in the fourth term. There's a restraint order of 26 million. And then we also are waiting recovery. Can you move to the next slide, please? Sienza, 
Uh, this is another <laughs> popular case, if I may say. Um, the matter is before court already. There are 10 people and three companies involved. Um, there's a restraint order. It was for the supply of 66,700 6, toilets. It was irregularly awarded to allegedly to that company. Uh, can you move to the next slide, please? Uh, the case is now coming up in October. It's a provisional date. I think it's the 3rd, 4th, and the 5th of October. Can you move to the next slide, please? Okay. From the snapshots that I have shown, you'll see that we have quite a number of cases that are already on the roll. A few that have been finalized, some are not even on the slide. We, as a province, we are doing our best to have these matters finalized. But you realize that there is a new trend now. We never get to the trial. There is always some indirect applications that the defense always come up with in these matters. And that delays the progress, you know, uh, in finalizing some of these cases, you know. But uh, the defense is within their rights in doing that. There's nothing much we can do about it. But uh, so far, we've tried our best to, to, to deal with these matters. But I, I just want to go back to what was raised earlier. You know, like what is difficult in, pro you know, what is it difficult in prosecuting these matters? A, for me, it's not so much the, the prosecution of the matter that is difficult. It is the stage that leads up to the prosecution. From the investigative stage, the interaction between us and the Hawks, because there's a lot of cooing and throwing. Because remember, we these are prosecution-led investigations. So there is a lot of cooing and throwing be between us and the Hawks. And in that process, there is a lot of delays. Um, but my view has always been that I would rather have a case, you know, when I summon an accused or an accused is being arrested, we, we have a policy that when that stage comes, we must have a draft indictment ready so that we, we don't arrest, then investigate. We investigate, then we arrest. So the, the difficulty is more the process not the actual prosecution. Because in the Eastern Cape, I think we are fortunate that we still have seasoned senior deputies like Advocate Seo, Advocate Hossein, and the Advocate McCoy, who are in charge of these respective uh, jurisdictions. And uh, those are seasoned advocates, so they know what they are doing. Uh, so when it comes to the prosecution of these matters, I am confident that we are always ready. I must admit that the process leading up to prosecution can be a headache at times. When it comes to capacity, uh, I must admit that we do have capacity constraints in terms of numbers. And uh, in the region, it happened that at some stage we're doing some recruitment and we, we, we couldn't find the, the right candidates, you know, for some of the positions. But I took a decision. I said to my deputies, if we do not groom our own people, we will not find capacity. We need to build our own capacity, you know, because it, as young prosecutors in the 80s, you would start, you know, from one small court, then you move to the next court until you go to a commercial crimes court, which was a court. So I said, let's go back to that. 
let's let's have matters in the district courts. Let's build capacity in the district courts. Let's create, you know, commercial crimes courts in the district courts. That is, there must be a courtroom set aside for commercial matters in the district court. In that way, you're building confidence, you're building capacity, and you're investing in the future of the organization. Because the experience that we have, both in the Hawks and in the NPA, the, the seasoned, you know, investigators are heading for retirement. And, you know, it's a concern because if we do not have any transfer of skills, we'll be, we're heading, you know, for doom. So what we're trying to do is to build capacity. Um, I think earlier, the last speaker mentioned the regional courts. We do have a few footprint in the regional courts. You know, we we have matters that are had in the regional courts. Um, but sometimes you'll find that some people have no appetite for commercial matters. You know, so you have to, you know, try to encourage them to, you know, to take up these matters because I always say to prosecutors, you will never know anything until you taste it. And once you taste it, you get addicted to it. If you get used to commercial matters, you know, you get addicted to them. You won't want to do anything else, but you've got to start somewhere. So we do have a footprint in the regional courts. Um, when it comes to prioritization, we, you know, the NPA has certain matters that it is prioritizing nationally, you know, and, uh, and in the provinces. There are those that must be dealt with, at least enrolled in the next six months. So we, there, there is something that is being done. Again, talking about resources, uh, we have a program that we've been running where we get, you know, expertise from outside that is appoint people on contract, you know, to assist in the commercial sphere. So we do have that program. Uh, and and, and uh, those people are really making a difference within the, the organization. Um, sometimes, you know, you, you mentioned forensics, you know, some, some of these matters sometimes delay due to forensics, you know, and they, I, and I must say that we need to collaborate, you know, where there is expertise that we can utilize, you know, and they, whether it's in the municipality or in the academic, in the academia, uh, I think it's something that we can use, you know. And we also need an, a forensic capacity even within NPA, uh, like we did in the in the Scorpions, where you had analysts, you had forensics, accountants that were part of the team, and and that is the capacity that we need to build within the the organization, because you'll recall that in the DSO, on the day of your arrest, you were served with an indictment. You were asked to bring your, your lawyers, and then you'd set a trial date. And that's where we should be. And that's where we're going as an organization, you know, whereby from day one, you get an indictment, we're ready for trial. I think one of the days where you arrest, you know, then postpone for further investigations, because that is counterproductive. Because once you bring an accused to court, as a first shooter, the onus, the onus is on you now to deliver. Um, so there was mention of experts and unlawfulness and knowledge of, you know, the relevant legislation. I, I have no doubt in my mind that my, my deputies are on the ball when it comes to this one. I, all we're trying to do now is to transfer the skills to the younger generation so that when, when these stalwarts leave the organization, at least they must have empowered a lot of you know young people because most of us are over 60 so the the end is near so the sooner we transfer these skills to the younger generations the better um so yeah i think i've covered capacity and and again when it comes to municipalities i, I agree with with the, with, with the last speaker that if you do not know 
the relevant legislation, the policies, you know, and how supply chain functions and how the tenders, you know, are, are dealt with, you know. Uh, you, you, you won't be able to prosecute these cases because you've got to understand how the system works. Uh, if you know how the system works, then, you know, your, your, your matters will be easy because commercial matters depend on your documents, on your source documents. If you have all your source documents and all your ducks in a row, you, you can't go wrong. But, it, but if you know you as a prosecutor have a doubt about your own case, then who's going to believe you? You're going to take a case to court that you're confident that you're going, you're going to win. A specialized expertise, I agree. You know, we need more. But I must say we do have some, you know, that we can build on. Um, the, regarding the investigations that are done by the municipalities, uh, it's something that we, we're going to have to look at, you know. Um, because remember where I come from, most of the municipalities are small municipalities, you know, uh, except your Buffalo City, you know, but you'll find that, you know, your, your hub, you know, where most of your cases come from. It will be the, the, the East London area, the entire area, you know. So um, so we've got to balance that. And when you are in Mtata, you know, you, you can't expect people from Bizana to come to Mtata for their trials. So we, we have to travel to those people so that people in that area can see justice being done right where they are. So that, that is what we, we, we have established. And uh, yeah, there was mention of smaller corruption matters. We, we're dealing with those, you know, we, in the lower courts. And I think the, the project that I've started, where we, 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 we said in the bigger centers, you know, where we know that there are corruption matters, let's have a, a district court room that is set aside for commercial matters. That's good for the prosecution, good for the defense, and good for the presiding officers as well. Because you, you cannot have presiding officers in district court dealing with your ordinary crime with no commercial matters, you know, in their court roles. So that's where we headed. That's what we've started. And I think this is going to be a success. I want to touch on the independence of the NPA that the last speaker spoke about. We've been crying for this for years. Um, the new NDPP is working on this thing. And if you ask what my view is on the subject, which may be career limiting, NPA should be treated as a chapter nine institution if for, for it to be effective. And the same resources that the DSO used to have, the IED must have those resources. Uh, and then we're going to have a, a winning formula. Collaboration with government departments, I'm sorry, with the provincial government. Uh, we're trying to do this in the Eastern Cape. We interact almost every Tuesday in the JCPS, you know, to deal with some of these matters. Um, and we are always in contact with the HOD. And, and the MECs on some of these matters. So yeah, we're getting there, you know, and your decentralization, I think in the Eastern Cape, we are, you know, ahead when it comes to decentralization because we've tried to reach out Port Elizabeth, East London, um, Tata, and in the future, the plan is to have a satellite in Queenstown, and then we'll have a balanced uh, uh, approach to these things. Uh, it's not perfect, you know, not a perfect picture, but we're getting there slowly but surely, you know. With those long words, Prof, may I hand back to you? Are you guys there? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Advocate Madolo. Uh, that was uh, a very informative presentation, um, and I see our list of questions have been growing. Um, 
my own immediate remark is I find the focus on case studies very interesting. My, I cut my teeth in uh, looking at prison corruption and their case studies are very important for two reasons. It's, it's firstly, tell, we can learn from that, what are the risk factors? How does, how is a public official corrupted? Um, and once we understand that we, the second important bit is that we can then see what corrective measures can be implemented. And I think there are many lessons to be, to be learned there. But so um, if we can then uh, go through the questions, I'll uh, moderate. Um, the, the first uh, is from, and I think it's not the only question that he asks, is from um, Zubukile Maswana. Uh, and he's asking, uh, and the questions are in the chat box visible or should be visible to everyone. Um, he's asking about uh, the relationship, uh, well, Salga's role, um, and he's saying in well-recognized municipalities, subordinate pensions were withheld for more than six months without them facing charges. How was this allowed to happen, even though it was raised with the pension fund ombudsman? Um, what is the definition of, the, of corruption in, in such a, a matter? Uh, this is no field of expertise. Yap, do you want to take a stab at this? Uh, if we can't answer a question, then we can't answer a question, but uh, at least we must uh, see if we can come up with a response. I'm afraid I don't have a specific response to that. It's quite a specific question uh, related to a, a specific set of circumstances, but I, I do think the the, the reference to the role of the South African Local Government Association is a relevant one. Um, of course, it is the mouthpiece, the voice of local government, but also plays a critical role in supporting local government and protecting its integrity. Um, and I do think that the South African Local Government Association has uh, implemented a number of projects, uh, I think related mostly, I think, to um, improving internal systems within municipalities was related to another question that was that was posed about uh, you know the focus on enforcement yes um, but what about the the internal systems within municipalities and I think I, I couldn't agree with that more um, of course today's discussion is about prosecution you know the tail end of of, of matters but there are so many layers of um, yeah, of, of defense within municipalities and within the broader system of government that, that should work better. You know, your first level of defense is, is how are decisions made and how are systems made to work so that um, no mischief is possible uh, right there and then. When the decision is made to award the tender or to appoint a staff member, and there are so many things that go wrong there, and it comes through in a number of the questions, you know, why are officials who are charged with gross financial misconduct are still employed somewhere else? Um, how does the internal audit unit of a municipality not come into play, the risk management? So there are all those levels that should work better. And the second level of defense, you know, is the oversight within municipalities, the role of municipal councils in conducting oversight, uh, which often also lacks political will and is, is fraught with difficulty. The third level of defense is, you know, the internal disciplinaries. When something is detected to have gone wrong within a municipality, the person must be charged, the person must be prosecuted internally uh, and dismissed if, if, you know, if it, if it is successful. All those things must work and must work better. So I completely agree with that. But I also think that you, you cannot just focus on that. We, we cannot have a situation where we just focus on internal systems because frankly, some people really need to go to jail. Uh, and really, we need more of, of, of you know, people in orange overalls is the popular term. Um, because this, this statistic of, you know, convicting four people over a period of 14 years where we come from, that is not on. Um, and no, uh, no emphasis on internal systems would, would, would justify uh, coming out with that statistic. So we, we do need to also um, improve 
our enforcement through the criminal justice system of the mischief uh, that does happen within within municipality. So, yeah, maybe that by way of a very generic response to a very specific question, which yeah, which I, I'm afraid I, I can't comment more on. Thanks, Lucas. Thanks, Yao. Um, yeah, I, I think it's, uh, it's Ivan Pillay's comment uh, about uh, looking at more the prevention systems development side. But I think over time, one has to accept that if, if one looks at the three minimum requirements for an anti-corruption strategy, that that focus may shift over time. At certain stages, we may focus more on prevention than prosecution. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think at the moment, we, we really want to see, and, and, and that's the focus of today's discussion, is a focus on prosecutions. Um, but so these things change over time. They're not static. Um, the, there was a very specific question again, Yap, to, uh, it looks like it's to you, whether your investigation only looked at municipal officials or whether it, it also looked at the role of labor in municipalities and dealing with corruption. Oh, I, I can answer that one quickly. We would have loved to, but you know, you always do these um, investigations, this research within a limited envelope, a limited budget and uh, we, we couldn't, we would have loved to uh, include more interviewees, uh, but we, uh, we were not able to do that. But uh, maybe that's, that's a, a great case for a follow-up research. Uh, we, we focused our research uh, on interviewing municipal officials, municipal councillors, and provincial officials. And that already produced an interesting picture, which by no means is complete. You know, with all these things, it's always, there's always, uh, uh, um, you know, you could always have done more research and interview more people, which would have provided a more picture, um, but that is what, yeah, what we had resources for. Thanks, Lucas. Um, there are two comments from Charles van der Valt dealing with the Free State and, and Manga Hung about, uh, he's saying that if the municipality has to prosecute, the cases would amount to nothing, not even speaking about lack of capacity. Um, and I suppose it does raise questions about what, what are the minimum capacity requirements uh, in a situation like that? And uh, perhaps Advocate Badola, also from your side, any comments on, 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 a situ or on this uh, comment or question about municipalities actually engaging in prosecutions? Um, if, if I can uh, open up to both speakers. A, my answer to that is no. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. I, I wouldn't encourage that. A, I would rather they, they give us those courts so that we can expand our footprint because we need more courtrooms, you know. So I would rather have some of our commercial matters head there. But collaboration with municipality, I agree. You know. Yeah, yeah uh, comment from your side on this. No, I think I think that that I mean I'll I'll defer to the real expert here. You know, these are just sort of ideas that come up, um, and and uh, and of course they, I, I also really try to make the point there, there's pros and cons, you know, um, to to the idea of of greater scope for for municipal uh, investigation and prosecution. The fact of the matter is that investigations already happen, of course, because municipalities must investigate to prepare disciplinary charges. But you know that's a different context. Uh, that's in you know in, basically in terms of employment law, uh, as a completely different threshold of of, of proof. Um, but information is gathered by municipalities um, and also by provinces. Um, it, 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 it did puzzle us a bit when we heard, and this is not a consequence of the Western Cape, so it's different from the Eastern Cape, but the Western Cape, you know, um, producing these reams and reams of, 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 of data uh, in, in the context of these commissions of inquiry. Mm -hmm. Um, and then being quite uncertain about what actually happens to it, you know, when you collect all that evidence, you interview all these people and you collect all that evidence and it's done by, not by, by officials, but by, you know, they would appoint senior advocates to run these, these commissions of inquiry. 
Um, and then it, it seems like everything must be done from scratch by the NPA once uh, you know a preparation must be must be done for a criminal investigation. So one does then wonder, you know, is 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 there scope for greater collaboration where you know the 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 the, the prosecution and investigation could be led by the NPA, but maybe the municipality or the province could do some of the footwork um, that that can assist the NPA. With, with the investigation. I don't know, it's just thinking out loud and, and looking at, at opportunities to expand the, I suppose, for, for the NPA to, to, to make itself a bit bigger, not necessarily uh, within itself, but also by using the resources that, that are available within, within government. And I, it's very encouraging to hear from Advocate Maduro that that, that is happening within, in the Eastern Cape. The picture that we got from the Western Cape was that, yeah, that, that was a bit more difficult and, and there wasn't that that much collaboration and, and the province often sort of looked, uh, you know, was a bit sort of disappointed, but that all their hard work uh, it led to, to very little um, in, in, in the space of, of criminal prosecution. But, but maybe that's also something that has improved uh, since then. Thanks, Lucas. Thank you. Um, these uh, a comment and a question from Sid Catton, uh, and it sounds uh, a rather desperate statement, and he, and he gives the details of more than 100 criminal charges uh, laid against somebody with the Hawks and to no avail at the town itself continues to be one of the most corrupt in the country. It's, it's not in the message from which town this is. And asking what can we do to tackle the problem. And I think that is very much the, the topic of today's conversation and, and using the experiences from the Eastern Cape uh, as a resource to, to demonstrate, yes, things can be done. And it seems that if the NPA um, and the... Uh, the, the NPA seems to have deliberately spread its uh, footprint to, to other parts of the province, engaging in provincial structures on a regular basis, such as the uh, JCPS cluster. So those are, I think, at least some responses to, to Sid Catton's questions about what to be done uh, about the problem because it is indeed on an individual level at the in individual municipalities that things go wrong. And there we need prosecutions in the district and regional courts. Uh, but any uh, comments from uh, Advocate Madolo or Ya? Yeah? And I think for myself. Okay, then we can move. Uh, I think here's a very specific question uh, for Advocate Madolo. Do we have an indication of whether the SIU investigations give better, better outcomes? Okay. <laughs> AJ, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, look, we, we do a lot of work with the SIU, all right? And they refer their matters to us, okay? And in turn, we must refer those to the Hawks, you know. Um, and, and I've always held the view that when the SIU does its investigations, you know, I, I like their investigations because, you know, they, they, they sometimes they are crisp, you know, and, and, and to the point. Uh, but then they must still go to the Hawks you know, for what you'd call an investigation for court purposes, all right? So we end up being a post box, you know, for, for them, that is between us and the Hawks, you know? And, and uh, I've always held the view that we should amend that section so that those investigations are taken directly to the Hawks with a prosecutor on board, we'll assign a prosecutor because it doesn't help to be a post box, but that's a matter for another day, you know. But then it becomes a duplication because you've got the, the, the SIU investigating for different purposes, then the Hawks investigating the same matter 
for criminal court purposes, you know. So I, I, I don't fault the, the investigations of the SIU. I like them, I enjoy it, I enjoy them, they're always crisp. But unfortunately, this post box business doesn't all go well for us, you know. I, I think we need to work on that. And, 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 but the collaboration is fine. You know, especially in my province, we work well with, 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 with the SIU, you know. Thank you. Um, there is a question, a very long comment and question from Amo Zungo about uh, the capacity to investigate corruption. Um, but capacity is not enough. There also needs to be political will. Uh, and he's then proposing can a centralized investigation unit per province that will be established to investigate financial misconduct in, mis in municipalities not yield, I assume, better results, also ensure consistency for investigation. Capacity constraints can be mitigated by hiring and training people who have local government experience. And, and that, that seems, at least on the face of it, a sensible suggestion. Uh, but uh, who wants to, to kick off on that? Uh, so we're talking about a provincial unit, but then with also with some further devolution of... Uh, capacity let's see a job that yeah. i can have i can have a stab at that one I'm, I'm, I'm again not not an expert but the one thing that we did hear from the people that we interviewed was you know just just the basic reality that uh, investigating corruption is expensive it's very expensive hiring forensic auditors uh, is very expensive and for a, a small municipality to hire top-notch forensic investigators, they come uh, at, at hourly rates that, that make us uh, shiver, uh, Lucas, uh, as, as poorly paid academics. Uh, so, so, you know, it's expensive to investigate corruption, particularly complicated corruption cases. So, you know, the, the sort of the, and the, the, the second point with NP, so what about economies of scale? Can't, can't municipalities work together uh, on this, maybe with the assistance of the province, maybe through the facilitation of the district, that within government there is not this uh, reliance on a single municipality hiring expensive forensic auditors. Uh, there certainly is scope for greater collaboration. In what configuration, I, I don't know exactly, but you have, of course, the you know, the, the, the DDM approach by government, you know, for one budget for every district, um, for one budget for every metro, where the entire government comes together and, 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 and collaborates for that specific district. Now, that, of course, focuses mostly on infrastructure and planning, etc. But maybe part of that could also focus on, you know, let's work together to investigate corruption at, at a certain economy of scale. Um, so, as I'm gathering it, it wouldn't necessarily help the NPA in the criminal justice system because I think there's there's that reluctance to 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 you know to to really sort of merge the two and, and that for very good reason. Uh, but I've heard lots of interviews saying you know we we can band together a bit more and um, and collaborate, but it, it requires political will and you know there is lots of tension politically within municipalities also between municipalities they don't want to collaborate with one another because they don't belong to the same political party and so we need to overcome overcome all of that um in in, in if we want to achieve um the economies of scale in maybe such a basic thing as procuring investigative capacity which comes at a very high price Madora, comment from you on, uh, on this issue? Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult one, to, uh, Chair. You know, but if we could have that investigative capacity in a municipality at district level, and it has to be independent and work in collaboration with the hawks, you know, Maybe we can get somewhere. You you understand, because yeah. because remember th there is always a risk of a municipality investigating itself. You know, unless you have that independent capacity, you know, 
um, that can be at a district level dealing with the local municipalities within that district. You understand? Collaboration is not a problem, you know, but we, we've got to guard against, you know, conflicting interests and, 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 and all that and all that. You know, it's, uh, it's something that maybe we should look at going forward. Um, but we need to bring the Hawks on board. I think maybe they should have been part of this, you know, maybe next time we meet, let's bring them on board and, and discuss those things with them. Let's, let's wait for the Hawks to publish in the Daily Maverick like you did, and then we can uh, talk. <laughs> That's my biggest uh, claim. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a question from uh, Mzubikile Maswana uh, talking about uh, his alleging advocates are abusing the process of disciplinary proceedings. So this uh, hints more in your direction, Yaak. But I think also we see... Um, excessive interlocutory applications from defense councils uh, at times. It also has this appearance of abusing the process. And, and, and perhaps it's a topic outside of our uh, remit today. Um, mm -hmm. But yes, there, there is this impression often created of, of people abusing the process and, and thereby frustrating the good intentions that local authorities may have to address corruption. Any comments from either of you? Uh, I can give it a try. Uh, the one thing is, yeah, uh, there's abuse there. I, I haven't got any specific details on how advocates abuse the process, but I'm sure there are rotten apples in that profession too uh, that abuse uh, disciplinary hearings. But let me add another dimension. Municipalities also abuse disciplinary proceedings. Um, there are lots and lots of anecdotes and stories of municipalities abusing disciplinary processes for political ends. So when you fall out of favor as an official, you fall out of favor with the MM or you fall out of favor with the mayor, uh, you just get charged um, and, um, and then, you know, for, for frivolous reasons and you get worked out uh, through, through that mechanism. Uh, so there's, yeah, there is abuse throughout the system. One of the core, I think, reasons for that is of course, the, the pervasiveness of, of politics in local government. I think we all know that local government is over-politicized, but also the, the extremely detailed legal framework, the over-regulation of local government, which is another cause, uh, I think, for this, which I think gives rise to, to abuse, because there is always a rule that can be abused, either by the advocates, and there's the people that are charged or by the municipality uh, who just uses rules to get rid of uh, unfavorable people that they no longer want in the administration or in the council. So, yeah, it's, it's a widespread problem. Thanks, Lucas. If I um, may. Sure. Thank you, sir. Um, you know, I'm not going to go into the disciplinary processes. That's not my domain. Um, but when it comes to interlocutory applications, you know, I, I will not use the word abuse, you know. Hey, having been in private practice before, you know, it's within one's right to, to use whatever legal, you know, uh, defenses or obligations that are available, you know. So we cannot uh, say they are abusing the process, you know, but what we need to look at is whether our justice system has not reached a stage where we should be more um, moving away from the accusatorial system to a more inquisitorial system. Because, you know, the, the two are worlds apart. Uh, the accusatorial system tends to be a competition, you know, between the state and the defense, you understand? But if the system would be more inquisitorial with the presiding officer being part, you know, of this instead of being a referee, uh, maybe we can all get someone, you know, 
but I know that's a far cry. <laughs> and it won't get much support from any, anyone, but but is it not time that we, we moved to a more inquisitorial system? Maybe the academics, you know, should look into this, you know. Are we, you know, because in practice, you know, you, you know, judges, you know, and all presiding officers have to do, you know, be part of the case planning and all that and all that, you know, management, that is case management, we understand, which effectively means we, we, we're slightly moving towards a more inquisitorial system, you know. Uh, I think our trials would be shorter, you know, uh, if we were to move to that direction, you know. Uh, I think the, the, this thing of a uh, presiding officer being just a referee is, you know, no longer good in the, in, in the world that we live in today. That's a thought, food for thought for academics to look at. And, uh, yeah. and, and I think that can make a lot of difference in, in our justice system. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the, the number of comments from Jonathan Walton, um, and for the sake of time, I'll cut uh, to his question. And he's asking, what is the most significant trigger to commence an investigation? And what steps would you advise residents to take to trigger an investigation? Which I think is a, is a very sensible question to ask. So what's, what's the threshold to commence an investigation and what can ordinary people do? Uh, there were some other comments of people laying charges and saying nothing happened, but I think let's, uh, let's look to the future. Well, I'm, I'm in a very, you know, unfortunate position because most people in my area know me. So you drop me a WhatsApp, I check the merits of the thing, I refer it to the relevant authorities, and that's it. You know, I, so rather, you know, you, if you report a matter, even if you tell the, a prosecutor, a prosecutor will tell the, you know, the police, you know, will refer you to the right door, if I can put it that way, to, to, to have your matter dealt with, you know, because some of these matters never come to court because people are quiet. You know, people know a lot, but it's silence that is killing the system. You know, so we, we do have intelligence. We do have everything. So someone must trigger investigation. You know, if you don't get any joy at station level, come to us, we'll assist. Thank you, I think the, the principle is there that uh, the MPA needs to be accessible. Uh, that, that, I think, is the important thing. Yap, any comments from you on this? Okay. Um, let me move on. Um, there is a long comment from Amo Zungu uh, about success by the NPA in the Eastern Cape and how that is measured. Is there a list of allegations and investigations? Um, and he's, he's asking, we could be looking at a very small number of cases and conclude there is good news, whereas if there could be information showing the entire population of allegations and investigations, uh, we can come to common ground when it comes to progress. Um, I think it's uh, it's the scope of this webinar to look at these advances. Um, and of course, there may be many more uh, allegations. Um, but uh, Advocate Madolo, any comment from you on this? Yeah, we, we have a lot in our books. Uh, I think Advocate Kosin, if he is online, or Advocate CEO can add to that. We have a lot in our books. There will be in there will be arrests soon. Uh, if you watch this space, we should have arrests before the end of this week. Another municipality. 
But I, I don't know if Apostle Hussein is there just to tell you what we have in our books, you know. East London, Port Elizabeth, Mchata. We have a lot in our books. Okay, no, I can, I can uh, very well believe that. Um, there is a question from Mzontsundu uh, Ngeba uh, asking, Advocate Madolo, you haven't mentioned the progress in the Mkunu local municipalities, black refuse bags amounting to 10 million rand. I'm not familiar with the case. I don't know, Advocate Madolo. That, that's one of the matters that has been very elusive, Chen. We've had a number of interlocutory applications, and the last of which was about a month ago. And that matter was struck of roll. We are reinstating it for August. Okay. Yeah. Um, Can I make a quick comment on the land sure. use issue, Lucas? Yeah, I saw, I saw in the chat one or two comments about um, corruption in land use, uh, and this is maybe something for more for future purposes. And this is now uh, not really the, the, the direct focus of, of 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 today's discussion. But I'm of the view that we haven't yet scratched the surface of the corruption that's taking place in land use management, and we also highlighted it in our research because if you think of it, when a municipality rezones a piece of land from let's say agriculture to residential by the stroke of a pin that piece of land quadruples or even more in value you create huge value by just a municipal decision uh, on land use um, and what makes these things very very difficult but obviously that attracts corruption because if you can buy that official or you can buy that municipal planning tribunal or, or influence its decision in one way or another you can create huge value for yourself. But the, the difficulty with it, it, there is no paper trail in the municipality. This is not a case of, of an official putting his gr grubby fingers in, in the till and there's a paper trail that can show procurement problems or difficulties in, in, in that area because the value is created through a seemingly clean process and there's an exchange of benefits somewhere else outside of the realm of the municipality's uh, bank account, which makes it difficult to, to trace. Uh, but I think certainly in the Western Cape where land values are high, uh, I think that is an area that is not sufficiently investigated, let alone prosecuted the kind of, of uh, corruption and, and um, nefarious influence that is exerted in municipalities and I think elsewhere in government as well when it comes to, to land use. Uh, so just something to, to watch for, for future purposes. Thanks, Lucas. Okay, uh, I'm keeping an eye on the time. So I'm going to look uh, specifically at, at questions uh, for our panelists. Um, the comments are there for all to see. Uh, there's a question from Johan Sienekal asking whether retired police officers will assist as municipal investigators um, and whether this can become an issue at trials. They're not entirely sure what the implication is there, but I'm not a lawyer. Uh, but Advocate Madolo, uh, the use of retired police officers as municipal investigators? Hey, che, I, I, I would rather, speaking for myself, have those retired police uh, officials uh, boosting the hawks. Because, you know, I've been in the criminal justice system for years. And, and I, I know which retired police officials can add value to the Hawks. You know, people that have been in the commercial space since the 80s. You know, those are the, the, the police officials who would bring a docket to you with a pressy, a summarized version of the docket. You know, that's the expertise that we need, you know. I, I would support that, but 
don't take them to the municipality, boost the existing investigating capacity, you know, um, because we're losing those, you know. I think the last generation will be living in the next year or two, you know, more expertise that we're going to lose, you understand. So I support that, but I'd rather have them boosting the, the hawks and the ID. Okay, um, there, there's some uh, really useful comments uh, from participants uh, about the requirements of uh, transparency and accountability in decision making. There's also from Heinrich Elbert that his own research uh, pointing to problems in officials, but also investigating officers not being a fay with the uh, Municipal Finance Management Act uh, and, and other legislation. There's a lengthy comment from William Kutzer uh, uh, that's talking about skills and capacity. Um, and uh, I'm trying to look for questions here. Um, It seems most of these are, are comments. Um, then Can I just the... before, because the, the issue of transparency, if I may. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Uh, just, just, uh, just to completely agree with that, and, and going back to the, the role of citizens and residents, you know, in, in other research that we've done, uh, we've just looked at a very basic question of, do municipalities publish information about their procurement on their websites? And, and the results are actually shocking. Um, municipalities, tell the public very little about what they are procuring at what price and who gets it. You'd really struggle as an ordinary resident or as a community-based organization or a civil society organization in a municipality to figure out what is my municipality purchasing at what price from whom, and more importantly even, is, is that what is being, being procured actually being delivered? Because there's a lot of corruption in that area. And, and a very basic and, I, in my view, fairly simple step should be for municipalities to be much more transparent uh, about what they procure, who gets it, at what price, and whether it's being delivered, because that will empower residents yeah. uh, to bring cases uh, to the attention of the municipality and, of course, also to, 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 to the Hawks and the NPA. Thanks, Lucas. Thanks, Yap. Um, there's a question from Danesile Mkwanazi uh, asking about... Uh, is there any way in which the NPA may consider hiring accountants, considering one of the concerns that were raised uh, was about uh, the costs of paying for an accountant? I think the, it's, it's a question of money, but I don't think there are any legal uh, hurdles to, to such a step. Uh, Advocate Madolo? That, that is under discussion, Chair. Uh, it was raised with the NTPP in our last meeting, so it's it's under discussion, you know, especially you know, especially now that we have the ID. Okay. Right. Um, I think Nancy Heron's question uh, links up with what you said earlier, Yap, about what can civil society do, and it's about insisting on transparency. Uh, because we know without transparency, there can be no accountability. So um, anything you wish to add to, to Nancy's, uh, Hiran's question? Uh, no, I think I'm, I'm covered. Thank you, Lucas. Okay. Um, then Chris Derby is asking about a uh, new structure an independent anti-corruption investigations body, perhaps a chapter nine institutions. Uh, is this possible? Is the good thing? Uh, will it solve all the problems? Uh, I, I'm a firm believer in form must follow function. So yes, if there is a, a justified, a clearly defined function, yes, this may be feasible, but uh, I'm, I'm not the panelist here. Advocate Madolo, you also mentioned uh, chapter nine institution. Jay, I would rather have the NPA being a chapter nine institution. But regarding this anti-corruption, I know that, I think the president once mentioned this, you know, so I would rather not comment on that one. I'll leave it to my bosses to do. <laughs> 
it, it would require a constitutional amendment. Yeah. Uh, that, yeah. Uh, from our side, we've been advocating for, for much greater structural independence of, of the NPA. Uh, yeah. Continue to do so. Um, these, uh, I'm, I'm looking for questions. Uh, it seems there are lengthy uh, and numerous comments and uh, I'm also keeping an eye on the time. Um, so if I can then give it to our panelists to make any concluding comments. Um, Advocate Padolo? Uh, all I can say is that say, I want to thank you for this opportunity. Um, I must say I was a bit reluctant. Uh, I'm not, you know, a media person, all that. But but Miss McKegge is very persuasive, so I had to oblige. But we 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 want to keep on accounting to society, and uh, maybe in the next six months we will come back here and, and account again for what you know we've committed to do. So I really want, I appreciate this opportunity and, uh, and thank you. Over to you, Thank Jean. you very much. Uh, yeah, any comments from you? No, thanks, Lucas. I mean, I think after those, I think um, beautiful words by Advocate Madolo, very encouraging and uh, not much to say from my side other than just to thank uh, Advocate Madolo for, for joining us and for giving us a frank insight into the progress and also the concerns and challenges of the NPA. So it's much, much appreciated. We hope to do this more often. We hope this, was, this wasn't uh, something that put off um, the NPA and the, you know, the many, many uh, capable and committed people that work there to, uh, yeah, to, to, to account to, to, to society about the work that they do. Um, so, um, so thank you very much for coming and, and thanks to you also, Lucas, for convening us and sharing us and uh, back to you. Thank you very much to uh, our two panelists. Um, I also uh, want to express my sincere appreciation for all the comments that we have received. I think there are some really some very insightful comments and, and I encourage everybody to take a look there. Um, it, it really just wasn't possible to get through all of that uh, in, in the time constraints. Um, so um, by way of closure, I would just like to thank uh, the people operating in the background who make these things possible. Uh, there's Crystal Nitsky from ACJR. Uh, and then uh, Advocate Madola has also already commented on the uh, persuasive powers of the Chief Director of Communications at the NPA, uh, Bulewa Makeke. Uh, so she has done a lot of work uh, in the run up to this. So thank you to, to both of you for your efforts here today. And then, of course, uh, thank you very much to the Hans Seidel Foundation for making this event possible, and also for the Open Society Foundation that is supporting our work on the National Prosecuting Authority. Uh, so uh, uh, my last word is uh, please uh, respond uh, on the survey. Uh, we, we do look at your comments and we do take them to heart. So thank you very much for that. Um, so with that being the last word, uh, thank you all and please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Advocate Madolo. Good luck with your work. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I'll be in touch. <laughs> Thanks a thank you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Tizzy. Thank you.
Bye, advocate. Bye, thank you. Sorry. Sorry.